to near-infrared spectroscopy. Okay, we'll get to that later again. So how many here have worked with someone, like in research or UW or something, that has an NIRS instrument? Okay, how many have their own NRS instrument in their own research department or something? Okay, so that's as close as we get. How many use NIRS testing, like on a regular basis? Okay, okay, so I guess right, we got Vance here, so Vance, <laughs> um, and then some others who, who are familiar with. But I, I, I took a guess as to like how in, in depth to go here, okay? And first of all, you're going to ask, why do I care about NIRS? Okay? If I go to the hospital and I use an MRI, somebody uses an MRI on me, I just want it to work. I don't care what you're doing, make sure it works. Okay? Well, the difference between there and what we're doing here is that there is no overseeing body for NIRS. Okay? Um, anybody know what NFTA is? I'm sure you've heard that in some, uh, lots of articles in hordes and, you know, Progressive Forbes, they, they all, they're going to refer to NFTA. NFT is the National Forge Testing Association. They have a proficiency program for wet chemistry and NIRS, but here's the deal. NIRS, they only recommend procedures, they don't require procedures. So whatever laboratories get for NIRS, sometimes you're guessing what their procedures are. So that's where we come in, okay? So we're the NIRS Forage and Feed Testing Consortium. We are the only organization like us in the whole United States that we're aware of, although there are lots of organizations, one called IDRC, which um, works with diffuse reflectance, blah, blah, blah. But there are a whole group that works with pharmaceuticals and all this other stuff, okay? So we're the only organization that we know of. So we are working to standardize methodology across the board. And so if you use a, a lab that uses NIRS, we hope that you use a consortium laboratory that are members of our consortium, okay? And this is why, okay. So we estimate that about 75% of forages are tested by NIRS in the United States, whether you know it or not, okay? So that's why we're doing this, okay? So first thing, let's just briefly, this is kind of a conversational thing, it's a little bit different, it's not a PowerPoint presentation. So we've got lots of um, verbiage here, but then we've also got some, um, some images that we're gonna look at too, okay. So, let's first briefly talk about soil testing, tissue testing, and then forage testing. So, um, soil testing, why do we want to do soil testing? We talked about this a little bit already, we've heard this. We want to know what's in the soil that's available for plants to take up, okay? Tissue testing, on the other hand, we kind of goes hand in hand with soil testing. We want to know what's available to the plants, but then we want to know what the plants take up. And so if we test the tissues, we can see what uh, nutrients are there. So if you take a look at this table down here, this is really good with the UW Integrated Crop and Management, Pest and Crop Management. Um, the left side, those are the nutrients that we're looking at, okay? They're elements, okay? They're going to tell us what these sufficiency ranges are, okay? So that's from um, tissue testing. For forage analysis, we can also use forage analysis for seeing how we're doing in our soil because the, the quality of our forages are going to be reflected in the quality of our soil as well. But with forage testing, we are going to look at quite a bit different parameters, okay? So forage testing is done because we want to predict what the performance of our animals are going to be, okay? So let's take a look here at the third paragraph on page two, and we've got some numerous publications that are forage quality, super good. I like this University of Georgia Bulletin. It's up to date, 2014. And what we've seen for dairy, the Dairy NRC came out in 2001. So we've got a lot of laboratories, a lot of researchers that have been updating their testing parameters and the types of terms that they're using for quality forage. And this, in 2014, this has got a lot of those new terms in there, okay? And we've got a couple of other ones that are listed there. Okay. So, if you want to cover that bottom, those two bottom um, um, little boxes there, if you, or if you haven't looked at them, go ahead and do that. The left pile is greener, the, the right pile is browner. If you take a guess, which one do you think is better quality? I think it's the greener one, right? Okay, but if you take your hands off those boxes, the RFQ and the TDN, total digestible nutrients, they're almost the same. 
Okay? So sometimes we can't tell just by looking. And surprise, surprise, in our pastures, we've got good, what you call it, not a grass eye, but we can't always tell what is actually in our fields. The, the nutrients really start to change in the fall, sometimes with, with environmental conditions, whatever. We're going to have different quality of our pasture out there, okay? And I'm going to mainly talk about forage testing, but then at the very end, we've got a really good article that we think that we wrote that, that kind of incorporates all those things. Okay, so, all right. so there are some good reasons why I want to test your forage quality, okay? I want to know what I'm growing matches what the seed person said. My environmental conditions have changed. We've got rain, we've got drought. What uh, insect pressure, what's going on there, okay? Changing the availability of forage, okay? So we had lots of forage in the beginning of the spring. And it was dry for about five weeks. And now it's wet again, okay? New species or varieties are being used. Maybe we want to grow some Sudan. What about sorghum? Let's try something new, okay? We want to see how that grows on our farm, okay? I want to see if the fertilizer I use is improving the forage quality. It's actually getting up to the plant. Okay, I want to balance my ration. Um, we want to see sometimes if we want to supplement our pasture with something, okay? Or we want to determine what nutrients are in our feed ingredients, okay? So this is back to what you're saying about the pasture requirement. But um, some of, uh, there's lots of supplementation that goes on, okay? Yeah. Okay, so how are we going to test forages, okay? We can test forages in two ways, wet chemistry and NRS, okay? So wet chemical techniques, they're specific to the method or particular constituent. So we call protein, we call different kinds of fibers. Those are called our constituents, okay? And that's the term you're going to see throughout my discussion here, okay? So the wet chemical techniques, they're overseen by groups such as NFTA, AOAC, which stands for Association of Official Analytical Chemists, okay? They change their name now a little bit. AFCO, Association of American Feed Control Officials, just in case you're wondering. Okay, so forage analysis results come in two forms, really, okay? Those that are defined by the analytes, okay? So protein, lignin, minerals, those are analytes. Those are constituents that are in that, that forage. And I bet you, some of you didn't know this, okay? Sometimes they're defined by the analytical method, okay? So actually, ADF, NDF, those are the names of the analytical method. ADF stands for acid detergent fiber. It's the fiber that that is left after acid detergent solution, same thing for NDF, neutral detergent, detergent fiber, okay? So we actually have forage terms that are based on the way they're analyzed, okay? So ADF, um, we've got, uh, let's see, NDF is ce uh, cellulose, hemulose, sorry, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, okay? And a few other things, silicon minerals. ADF is cellulose and lignin, and again, the silicon minerals. So, again, named after those, uh, those terms, okay? And crude protein, if you think you're actually analyzing crude protein, we're not, we're analyzing nitrogen in a sample, and we multiply it by this term, and then we get our crude protein percent, okay? Okay, so again, I'm gonna refer to this good list of common terms in animal feeding. It's in UGA Bulletin 1367, and that's in 2017. That's a really good updated one, okay? <coughs> So, we talked about all these different testing, forage testing. Now let's talk about NIRS, okay? It stands for Near Infrared Spectroscopy. Why do we want to use it, okay? It is a non-destructive, rapid, no reagent. So you're going to save some money there, okay? We can do multiple samples for the time and price compared to wet chemistry. And if we can do multiple samples, we can actually reduce error, okay? So, now, we're going to talk about principles of testing unknown samples, okay? So, a little bit of chemistry here, again, stick with me, okay? So, in your, in your um, handout here, you can see that your, um, your test tubes are multicolored, or the same color, but they're, they're multi-concentrate, okay? So, you've got lesser concentration on the left, higher concentration on the right. Testing unknown samples is really a lot like using a ruler, to measure the length of a piece of wood, okay? You know what you've got in your ruler, and then you measure your piece of wood. That is very much like what we're doing when we are testing unknown concentrations, okay? So here, this is an example, this is a maltose example. 
we're going to, we know exactly what those concentrations are because we built them, okay? Then we're going to plot that concentration, you see the chart below, the, the graph below. We're going to plot absorbance versus concentration, and then we're going to draw a line, a regression line. This is called the standard curve, okay? So that if we then test an unknown sample, did the analysis, read it through an instrument, okay? Let's say we get 0.5 absorbance. So absorbance is on the y-axis, the concentration is on the x-axis. Anybody have an idea what the concentration would be? If I have 0.45 absorbance, you go over to the line and you go down. So what do you think the concentration is? 90 or 85. Yep, yep, right around there, yep. Okay, so in a lot of conversations, that we hear about talking about NARS, people will say it's not as good as wet chemistry because it's an estimate, okay? It's not an estimate. We are predicting using the same principles here of known concentrations, okay? So, for example, actually, when we do a starch analysis with wet chemistry, we're using this methodology. We're taking known concentrations. We're not putting it in an instrument that says, oop, this is your concentration with a readout line. This is, I'm 100% sure, we're actually looking back and interpolating using known concentrations, okay? Same methodology is used with the concept of using known concentrations for NIRS, okay? So our measuring stick for NIRS is a big database of known wet chemistry results, okay? All kinds of constituents, protein, different kinds of fiber, starch, you name it, whatever we're looking for for nutrients, okay? So that becomes our ruler, and we call this chemistry our reference chemistry, okay? So the reference chemistry has to be really accurate, have to use standard methods, and we like the reference chemistry, we like it to be more than one sample. We like it to be a duplicate. Doesn't always happen, but we like it to be a duplicate, okay? So then we use these standard approved methods as well. Okay. So then what we do, we compare this known database, okay, so known concentrations to unknowns, and we do a similar, much more complex uh, multivariate regression, but it's a, it's a similar concept, okay? So let's go on to the next thing, okay? So let's look at our electromagnetic um, spectrum here, okay? Or, we have x-rays on the left, and all the way we've got a lot higher frequency um, wavelengths like microwaves. Near infrared is between 800, actually 780 nanometers, to 2500 nanometers, okay? A lot of the instrumentation that we use actually collects visible light too, because guess what? The greenness or some of the coloration, we we're still kind of looking into how that can be usable data, but we also collect some visible light in there. But the NIR spectrum is from 780 to 2500, okay? We're going to use NIR in that region because it reacts with the sample in a certain way, okay? So if you're taking the example of, of let's say, sunlight, you've got some infrared light there, how does it feel when it touches us? Well, how does it react to us? Warm. It's warm, okay? So NIR is going to react to a sample in a different way, okay? So it reacts to the sample, and what we're looking for are these bonds here. Oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen carbon, oxygen nitrogen. Those are the most important bonds, and when NIR hits them, they react in a certain way. Okay? So it's that interaction that's really important to us. Okay? So what happens, normal molecular bonds with, with hydrogen have this vibration, and that's what we're depicting on the, next, on the top of the next page. They wag, they wave, they vibrate, they jiggle. There's all these different kinds of, of movements that they, that they have. When NIR light hits them, that is collected, that information is collected in a certain way, and that those vibrations are, are important. Okay, so those, those uh, hydrogen bonds that we were talking about, we can expand that to functional groups, and these functional groups are then associated with the type of nutrient we're talking about. Okay, so the, um, the fourth one down, I uh, hope you can see that, um, the NH3, okay, that's an example of one we're going to connect that functional group to protein, okay? Um, we've got water up there, we've got hydroxyl groups, but these are just examples. And um, this is actually quite a complicated table, we could talk about overtones, 
uh, so on, but the overtones are talking about the vibrations. We, we're not going to get into that. But it's interesting because I gathered this from a pharmaceutical paper, and which, which actually has simpler types of testing because the pharmaceuticals are much more pure. Forage samples are actually the most complex thing to test using NIR. Okay? So we're looking at those bonds and we're looking at those functional groups. So let's turn the page and look at the interaction of light and matter. Okay, so I was saying that when light hits the sample, three things can happen. It can be reflected, it can be transmitted, or it can be absorbed. Okay, so we're going to use these principles of light in our analysis. So the next diagram is what's going on in an NIR instrument. Okay, we've got a source of light. The source of light is usually an incandescent white light, and it's filtered to produce NIRS light. Okay? It's directed onto the sample, some of it is absorbed, some of it, it, it is interacts with the sample, and then some of it's reflected. What is reflected is taken up by this detector. And the detector collects that information and it's going to interpret it. Okay? So really that reflection and that, de that detector that collects it, that's the important part of that. Because what's reflected is also um, it representing what happens in the sample, the interaction of the sample, okay? Okay, so then, this is what we get in the NIRS laboratory, okay? We're gonna get a spectrum, okay? So in this table here, what we're looking at is four samples, and these, uh, these researchers uh, were looking at wheat flour samples, but I liked it a lot because it's, um, it shows you four samples, they happen to be in different colors in this graph, and it shows you how they're similar in some places, but yet they're actually very different, okay? So they probably have different protein, they probably have different um, sugar value, okay, different starch. So the output is in the upper left for these wheat, uh, wheat flour samples, okay? Um, so how do we get from this spectrum, this is what the instrument shows us, Okay. How do we get from that to that, to that report, to those, those numbers? Okay. Well, first of all, let's go back to those functional groups and those hydrogen bonds and those bonds we're talking about. Okay. You can see how those are associated with this spectrum. So water peaks are at 1450 and 1940. You can see those peaks. Okay. Crude protein peaks are at 1460 and 1540. You can find those peaks right where they're happening, right on that spectrum. Fat, 1700 to 2300. Okay? We can see how these samples are slightly different and how their peaks are different, but the, how they're also overall similar in the spectrum. Okay? So how do we go to getting that, those numbers in the, in the report, in the lab report? Okay? Okay. So if you, the next page shows a table. This is from UW Soil and Forage Lab. We, we use them for a lot. They're really great, okay? So here's a report on what the lab puts out, okay? And you can see that their methodology is listed on the right side, and um, NIR is used for multiple uh, constituents there, okay? We get from that spectra to the lab report by making a calibration, okay? And this is what we do in the consortium. We develop uh, NIR's calibrations, and they're going to, going to predict these unknown samples. We take a, a batch of samples, we start with about 100, otherwise you really don't get a good variation when you're starting with a new constituent. So for example, in the consortium, we have started to develop um, a, an equation for starch in halage. We found that there's some interest in that. So we're gonna start with 100 samples and then build from there, okay? We analyze all those samples by wet chemistry. So again, we have our known concentrations, okay? Then we're going to use a complex regression and multivariate analysis, and that part definitely is not my expertise. It's called chemometrics. It's an entire field by itself. Okay. So um, the software that the instrument has will have this calibration software, but we have uh, a, a technical specialist with the consortium that does just this because um, it's it's something that's um, the use of NIRS isn't really I don't know. Maybe there's one or two now in the United States where a university actually teaches an NARS class in association with forage analysis. Okay? So this mathematical model is called the calibration. Okay? And it's going to contain all the constituents that we're interested in. Protein and fibers, maybe we're looking at starch, okay? uh, sugars. 
So in the overall scheme, NIRS analysis, we're, it's not an estimate. We're not just saying this comes out of an instrument. It just it shoots out, and this is it's not a black box. We are going from start to finish, and we're making sure that each each of those parts makes sense and reflect back to that sample. So it's not an estimate; it's a prediction. Okay. In that example of maltose that we're talking about, it's called interpolating. Okay. With what you don't know, with what you do know. Here we're calling it a prediction. Okay. It's the same principle, except the, the, the models, the mathematical models, are quite a bit different in the NRS. Okay. So, last few things I want to talk about are performance and NRS calibrations. Okay. So, this is, this is where we come in. And, and, and this is all important for you guys because in discerning where samples go and, and what NRS results really mean. Um, we've had some discussion in the past, um, a producer takes a sample, I'm going to send this to lab A and this to lab B, okay? Well, there's, they're different samples. They, they say, that one was 20% moisture, or let's say, let's say that one was 30% crude protein. That one was 18% crude protein. Well, they're different samples, okay? Subsampling actually has its own specific analytical technique. Whether it's a raw sample or whether it's a super homogeneous dried and ground sample, there's specific techniques for that. So that's really where the discerning part comes in for you guys, it is understanding what's good in IRS analysis. Okay? So the first thing about performance, we want to build range into the calibration. Okay? We want a calibration that represents the population. Okay, of grasses, let's take that for an example. Okay, so we want a broad range of, of samples that represent those, those types. Okay, let's look at the normal distribution for a minute. A normal distribution is a bell curve. We've got some on the low end, we've got some on the high end. Most of the samples are in the middle. Okay, for an NRS calibration, we actually want that to look more rectangular. We want a lot of representation of the low quality, we want a lot of representation of medium, we want a lot of representation of the high quality. But also broad ranges of conditions like drought, if it's too wet, different varieties, species, chemical composition, multiple cuts during, this, during the same year and different years. Okay? We want to do this for each constituent. So starch should have a broad range, and NDF should have a broad range, and ADF should have a broad range, and so on. Give me a few minutes, we should probably have time for a few questions. Okay. Yeah. okay. So what we do, we test calibrations in the consortium to make sure they're performing for you guys, okay? We take samples completely out of the calibration that are totally independent of it, and we'll test the calibration, okay? We look at these calibration statistics, okay? Let's put to the next page. This is our actual calibration statistics for our leg unit calibration from the consortium, okay? So you can see how many samples we've got in all of these, for each of these constituents, what the mean is. The SEC is the standard error of the calibration, okay? We want that to be low. We want the, the SECV. You can read about that in the next paragraph, okay? These statistics are kind of complicated. They can get really complicated, okay? The last test that we do is we put real-world samples with it, okay? So we'll, we'll get samples in from our university labs and our members of the consortium. We'll get, all, we'll get samples from the real world and we will um, we'll, we'll test those with the calibration. Now, one example that that's really important is if we look at low lignin alfalfa. Low lignin alfalfa is really hot right now, but we've got at least three areas where low lignin alfalfa exists. The genetic research from companies like Alpha Rick Seeds and Four Genetics, they're doing their research plots and their development. And we've got university and government people that are taking those seeds and planting them out in their own plots. That's the second level. And we've got producers actually planting those out. So are we getting range in all of those? Okay? Because that's very important. We've, we've come to find out that the research is very different than the real world samples. Okay? We monitor and update the calibrations by adding all the time your samples, okay, from producers and from researchers. Okay? So Misinterpretation of data. Now this is where the producers and um, people in extension come into this, this type of situation, uh, come right, right up against it, okay? So 
The first problem with misinterpretation of manners data, I gave you an example, is the subsample, is the sampling itself. Okay? So a good sample, you can't get, you can't get good results without a good sample. Okay? The second one is a problem with sample preparation. Okay? So if you can look at your first uh, image there, you can see that's a really fine ground sample. It's homogenous. This is how it's tested in laboratory using one particular type of instrument. And if you look at the bottom picture, you'll see that's how it comes out of the grinder. Okay? There's fines at the top, which are leaves, and then there's stems and at the bottom. Okay? They're different color. If you don't mix that up and make it homogenous, you don't know what your sample is really like. Okay? So sample preparation is really a big deal. Um, we have developed a, um, a, a bulletin that we call Guidelines for Optimizing Accuracy and Consistency. Okay? That is a start-to-finish guide for how to ha handle samples in the laboratory going into NIRS analysis. So start to finish, laboratories. So we're working towards standardizing this methodology so that if you get NIRS results, you should be able to uh, say that, hey, these should be good results. Okay? The next one, sample ID. Okay? If you're going to have a corn salad, you should use a corn salad calibration and so on. Okay? Now, with researchers, we've come across what we call validation mistakes. They're just, the, the, the researchers, I'm, I'm blending it on them. Um, this is usually when we hear this one because they're looking at performance and calibrations. They want to test a new type of alfalfa, they want to see if the calibration is going to work for that. Okay? So usually the problem is they're comparing different things. Their alfalfa samples, they did what comes to using um, analysis A and we've got analysis B in our calibrations. Okay? And what we, usually, what we do for our calibrations, we use standardized methodology and accepted methodology. Okay? So they might be different. Okay, so that's a, a so make sure there's some time for questions because we don't have it's okay if we just pause for a minute and see if there's any questions that are burning okay. people in the lots of soil testing versus forage testing questions maybe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well you were just talking about having the standard standard examples compared to pasture is so variable. Um, how would you submit a pasture sample for an IRS? Okay, very, very good. Okay, so actually, and I don't we don't have copies of it here because I think Nadia can send you um, this PDF, and the links should be live. But if you go to Opportunities for uh, Pasture Analysis, I think it's on the last page. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a link there from an article that we did in, in Progressive Dairy that talks about pasture testing and NRS and tools for grazing management. And one thing I want to mention there is we actually looked through a lot of publications for how to, how to sample a pasture. On this end of the spectrum, you've got ecological sample, where there's a grid and everything is random and, and it's very systematic and scientific. Now on this end, you've got, I'm going to walk around and just grab some stuff. Well, we realize that there kind of needs to be a, a happy medium because with pasture uh, sampling, we're actually judging that we need to do this because if we do it randomly, we're going to pick something that the animal would refuse, most likely. Okay, so we, there's a methodology um, in that article that talks about kind of a, walking in a Z pattern, how many plucks to make, how big of a sample, and then how to treat it. So we recommend drying it, air drying it, or freezing it, and then sending it to the lab on ice. Okay, so that's really important because with fresh samples, it's going to deteriorate, it's going to continue to respire. Okay, so that's, the, the article really goes with that. It would, would it matter if we have different species composition of grasses compared to your standard. Um, will that matter or not? Though? Well, if you look at our, well, the example that I gave you with our calibration, that's a legume calibration. We've got one for what we call mixed hay, and that's going to have different percentages of, of, of the whole range of legumes and grasses in its mix. So it does a really good job of taking that all into account. That's good. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we were, I was just on the topic of expanding and monitoring and calibration. Uh, the, the software for laboratories will tell, will tell the user if a sample flags. She's got something really unusual. So these low lignin lignin alfalfa, which really aren't low lignin, they're just lower, just a little bit lower. They did, they did flag. They're like, ooh, these are different, okay? The digestibility is higher, the, the lignin is lower, okay? So we want to collect those and bring them into our fold. <laughs> So we're going to collect those from our researchers, we're going to collect those from producers, and we're going to, we're going to do our own analysis, we're going to look through, look through um, our instrumentation, and we're going to get into calibrations. 
So the bottom line with all me talking about all this is that we're here to serve extension, we're here to serve producers, so that we get your pasture samples represented. We already do. We've got multiple types of fresh samples, whether they're clipped, whether they're pasture samples that are plucked, whether they're research samples. We've got multiple, multiple fresh samples that are already representing our calibrations. We're in a really good situation for that. Got any more questions out there? Any questions for Patty? I know you're getting a little hazy, but the, the, like I said, the reason that we talk about this is because they're the overseeing body that, that, that educates about NIRS. You know, you will see one article that says NIRS stinks. And then you'll see lots of uh, articles. Uh, some journals don't even accept NIRS analysis. Okay? But it's not an estimate. Again, it is a prediction based on known solid results. Okay. Um, if, if I may just go into this multiple sampling idea, okay, because this is actually something that could be really useful to, to all of you guys, okay. So this is this is a, a table uh, or a slide actually from Dave Merton's. Um, he's he's great. He's worked with us for a long time. If you look at the whole range, there's two columns of single analyses. The range of all of these are the lowest is 38.1, and the highest is 42. Okay, that's about a four point difference. So if you're talking about NDF digestibility, that could be kind of important. So what happens to the difference with averaging multiple samples? Even if you average two samples, what happens to the standard deviation or the standard error? They go up or they go down? They go down. Yes, it goes down. And if you, if you do five samples, it goes really down. So our standard deviation when you do single samples is 1.34. With two, it's 1.19. It goes way down 0.77 if you do five samples. So somewhere in between there is kind of happy medium with like what's reasonable in sample collection. So for the same cost of doing a wet chemical analysis, you could possibly be able to take two samples and average them out, and you would have less error than if you did the one wet chemistry. Okay? Now maybe you don't want to do that all the time because the whole point of doing NIRS is to save money, right? Maybe you do it every 20th sample. You start building a database of, of what's really happening on your farm and you'll be able to kind of collect, collect information over time. Okay? I think generally just um, from a couple specifically organic valley farmers I've talked to about soil testing, they say they always learn a lot more if they soil test and tissue and forest test at the same time about what's actually happening out there. Like you said in the beginning, that could be something that you could recommend to a producer if they were totally confused as to what was going on with their, their systems. Um, I don't know if anybody has to, wants to speak to that for a minute, experiences they've had doing both of those types of testing simultaneously or around the, around the same time. Um, okay, just, just a couple more points on that last thing. I just want to point you in that direction. So we've got opportunities for cash analysis. We've got opportunities for multiple NRS platforms, okay? Just, just take a look at that article. It'll explain what we're doing across platforms. So not only do you have one NRS type of instrument, you've got different companies making different types of instruments, different kinds of optics, okay? And then um, this article uh, in Hay and Forage Grower, you can look this up online. This is a really cool one. Matt Bigman, he's at uh, River Falls now. And he's talking about in-hand forage quality. So this is portable units that you could take up to a sample and point it at the fresh sample, and it will give you some type of results. Okay? So that's down the road, too. I mean, that's really cool. Um, and this isn't in your presentation, but I don't know if you'd be able to see it very well. But the, the biggest hitch with uh, inline or fresh sample is um, the water peaks. Okay? So, probably can't see this very well, but if you look back at your spectrum there, the, the colored spectrum, I'm betting that those are undried samples because you can see the water peaks at 1450 and the next water peak down the road, okay? So if you dry and dry the sample, all of a sudden your variability because of water, water, um, it's a shadow over a lot, a lot of information. Okay? So that's why our standard is dry your own samples. Okay? So no matter how flashy the, the, the new instrumentation might look, it is really cool. But the standard is still a laboratory. Okay? Okay? 
Thank you, Patty. Okay. Um, no, I think we just want to make sure there's time for a few questions before I move into the evaluation. I don't know a lot of information, so Patty, you might want to contact Patty later. But um, I think the basic idea with this topic is we were trying to make it apparent too that doing forage testing, not just soil testing, and that's something that you should definitely speak with your producers about. Yeah. Um, I find very few uh, farmers actually do any forage testing. If they have a nutritionist, they do, but that's maybe 15%, okay. 20% at the most, from what I know. Sure, sure. Yeah. Or if they're buying, like Kevin's probably buying, what, 165 RFQ and above? I try to raise all of my, my uh, plantation for it and my dry colony, so then I'm just looking for quantity. Right. Yeah, I test I test the forage that I make for the milk health and try to pick and choose through that, but it's kind of an accurate value. Mm -hmm. right. and, and I guess our argument, especially in our pasture uh, sampling article, is that once you build a baseline, because um, Bill, was it Bill that said? Um, or, Maybe it was Brett or Gary. Um, when, what you thought was here wasn't really here. It was something 15, 20% different, okay? And what our eye sees, we get pretty good at grass eye, seeing what's available, but the, the, the nutritional quality that's there, it's not what we always think. And a lot of times that happens, we're gonna let them out here, but it's also what they select too. We're gonna let them out in this paddock, the milk just didn't add up to what we thought was gonna be there. Maybe better, maybe worse. So that's why we're advocating for build a database of, of samples on your land and on your pastures, and then kind of go from there. And then you probably will not need to sample as often, but you'll get a better eye then for estimating the nutrients as well. Anybody else? Back when I was in Minnesota, they had a traveling van. Are you doing that in Wisconsin at all? Well, that was that was um, that was back that's in actually the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ever heard of Minnesota? Is that not as accurate? I know what you're or? talking about. That actually, those people, that group, was actually the beginning, the advent of our consortium. Huh. Yeah. And so uh, that kind of testing in the dream and. John Schenck Sr., I don't know if that sounds familiar at all, but he's like the god, the guru in NIRS analysis. Um, the first person to test forages using NIRS, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank now, uh, was, was uh, out, out east and he used, looked at uh, samples in the 1960s, but then John Schenck developed the software. And so his dream was to be able to do that, take a portable unit and point at a sample and be able to see the results. So that's what he started out with, that's what that group started out with. They took these units, these big lab units, into the field in vans and, and tested that way. So we're not doing that because what we're going to do is then skip to the portable units, but we want to standardize their usage or kind of help with those. Thank you, Patty. Oh, one more question. Well, I would say, too, like with what Kevin's doing with the, like the null grain, that's that's the place where you really want to have a good idea of what your pastures are because you're you can be in serious trouble if you don't have you know somewhere close to what ideal for yeah yeah and if you're planting a new plant um like like this year uh i think you said you planted sudan uh, we also planted sudan this year and in the in the warm of the summer it was perfect but we never planted it before, so we kind of have an idea of what it should be. You can look up book values, but what is it out in my field, okay? And how am I going to, you know, spread, uh, separate my pastures out, the legume, the sudan, how am I going to do that? So that's a really, it's a really good tool for kind of balancing those pastures. Maybe instead of balancing ingredients, we balance our pastures. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So if you're planting something new, though, do you have the, um, the calibration for it? It depends. Okay, so if you're planting something new, we're, we're trying as a group are trying to constantly add new types of samples. So we've got, I'll give you an example of a grass calibration. We call it grass. Now other laboratories might split it up into annual, perennial, warm season, cool season. Okay, we've got it all into one. And we've got southern samples, Midwestern samples, but we're seeing that like more southern samples can be grown in the Midwest in the last few summers. Like Sudan grows really well because it, we need we need warmth and we, we had that this summer. So um, those types of samples, if we do have a new type of sample that just doesn't fit, 
then we're going to call our members in our laboratories, we're going to collect samples, we're going to add them to that calibration. And that's that whole process of updating. Okay? We're well connected to yeah. the other samples. We try to be, we really try to be, yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Well, thanks. I know that could have been a little bit daunting, but I think your, is your contact information on the thing? Is oh, I forgot about that. that. No, I'll send it out to you so that if you have more questions for Patty, um, she can help you wade through the, the forage testing gauntlet. Um, but yeah, once we can't turn across. Just go straight into the um, evaluation part. Uh, once again, you need to use the bathroom, go for it. Um, I'm just going to hand out some reflection questions. So the first part of it is going to be just reflecting quietly by yourself and then amongst your table. Um, and then we'll share a little bit. And then lastly, there's a um, handout here that you know, would be great if you could hand it in today. It's, a, it's an evaluation. There is the address on the back. If you want more time to think about it, you can send it back either via email or snail mail. Um, but I will hand this out um, during this, this first part. So the reflection questions are on the page I just gave you. And the first one is, um, what are your thoughts on the topics that were covered today? Um, Sub-question, are there areas related to organic pasture management that you wish have been covered and were not? And I've already got a little bit of feedback from people here today, so thank you for that. Um, but if there are topics that you'd like to see in future trainings, hopefully next year. Um, but also how things were covered today, the topics that were covered today. And the second question is, what are your thoughts on the format and delivery of today's workshop content? So essentially how it was delivered, not necessarily the content. Um, so please spend some time thinking about those two questions and jot down a few ideas. Um, and in a little while, I'll call you back to talk to your table. Diane, and just, just in context, um, yeah. we have a, like a real range of experience here, people yes. coming from different backgrounds and stuff. And so sort of the overarching context of particularly the content-related questions is what do you think an educator, you know, working for a land conservation department or extension would need to know, or NRCS would need to know to work with farmers, and was that covered? Um, so, you. you know, for those of you who are already have a lot of expertise and say, you know, there's nothing that I needed covered that wasn't here, put your other hat on and say if someone is just starting out, what would they need to know? Thank you, Diane. Very good. So yeah, just some quiet time for the next five or so minutes and we'll come back as a group in a minute. 